when I when I've taught in other places, I've never regretted recording. You know, so I always I'll I'll have this somewhere. I can't guarantee that I'll have it for the other ones. All right. So um, oh, and the only thing is because I'm new on this computer, I'm going to have to navigate a little bit. Oh. And now I'm confused because Capstone's the only one without that. Here we go. And there we are. Okay, so I want to give you my version of a seminar, but because, and you see that I, uh, I, I've actually modified it pretty extensively, but I forgot to modify the, the date, so you can fix that yourself. But this quarter, this year, we will be doing all these things. Um, we do have three professors, and so we have sort of a professor's corner right back in, in the back there. Okay, so we have Dr. Hunter for our bio representative, and we have Dr. Lindbergh as our physics representative. You know, they'll be, uh, and the really cool thing is they'll be available to discuss our topics with us. So when we have our discussion days, we'll be able to have kind of a panel of PhDs to talk to you all about the topics that we're going to, to uh, put their, their parts in. And, uh, um, also, we're going to have, you know, ethics have a different standpoint from medical ethics uh, standpoint and uh, scientific ethics um, also take place in physics. We'll be talking about all those intersections of the different disciplines. But I am the one who's standing up here and talking today. I'm the one who's taking point, okay? And I'm going to be um, organizing it. So if you have questions, please come to me about everything except for later in the quarter, we're going to have something about bio majors require an ETS exam. Are you all still doing that, I assume? Yes. Okay. So uh, that's always TBA. We'll work out something that works for you all. Is there, is there anything else about that to say now? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's my sentiments exactly. So um, we will talk about that. It will be, uh, I know it's another test, but it's a capstone sort of test for bio majors only. Biochemistry majors, by the way, you are chemistry majors, so you don't have to take that. Even though you start with bio, my whole thing, how many letters are in bio? Three. How many letters are in chemistry? Nine. Biochemistry is three quarters chemistry. Okay. There we go. Uh, if you have any questions, again, talk to me. But the schedule is as listed, and we are just going to have two discussions this year because we have a bunch of seminars lined up. So the final paper will be, the, the syllabus is going to have details. I do check it with turn it in, which means that you can't just cut and paste from a previous assignment. Even though the assignment is flexible enough, you might be tempted to do a little bit of that. I want you to do new work and new thinking. You should be able to have many avenues to do that. So that's my one warning to you. Please do not rework a previous assignment and definitely don't rework somebody else's assignment. Um, we'll check for that and we'll also check that you're quoting and citing correctly and things like that. But uh, the nice thing about Turnitin is it takes care of that and I can focus on what you talk about. And I want your personal reflection integrated into the scientific argument. I want you to have at least three substantial references. Peer-reviewed is always substantial. So if in doubt, go for a peer-reviewed paper on a topic that we talk about in class. I'm going to give you a bunch of topics today that will give you tons of openings for you to go after if you want to. So you can go ahead and get started on this if you want. Now, I'm going to go really fast today. It's one of the reasons I'm going to be recording it. And I'm also going to post the slides because there's going to be some references that you might want to use as jumping off points. Um, my point is to sort of take, uh, try to include everyone uh, in some way on a general topic so that you have places to go. The other four lectures are going to be more focused on the scientists' own research. And so those are going to be similar to graduate research seminars. And sitting and listening is actually a skill. Okay, what you're doing right now, it might not feel like you're doing much. It might feel like you're sitting in front of the TV, but you aren't. I'm here. They're here. And we're all looking at each other. So we actually are all present. And I want to encourage you to overcome the high uh, transition state energy that, that seems to be to raising your hand and asking a question. Feel free to do that at any time, even more so in this class. Although I realize it's late in the day, there's lots of people, you're afraid that somebody else might not want to hear your question, but actually mostly we do. So um, learning how to listen is one of the things that we'll be working on when we have these guest speakers here. 
And so you don't need to get everything out of a talk to get something out of a talk. What I want to know is that you're engaged with the talk specifically. And I will uh, not give full credit if I get something that looks like it's so vague, I'm not even sure that you are here. Okay, I'm gonna, I am going to read all of your synopses and I'm going to look over your notes. So that's why I ask you to bring pen and paper of some sort. I've, if you really, really want to use a laptop, you can, but I recommend for the future writing and pen and paper. I think you learn better that way and I always get better results from that. Um, but I want you to scan it turn it in in a week, give you a whole week to find the scanning machine and to turn it in and to write your synopsis, okay? Um, so, you know, the whole thing is when you take notes, you remember better and the more effort you put into your notes, typing only takes so much effort, writing actually takes uh, more effort and you have to condense more because it's slower. And I actually think that's good. So I'm going to encourage you to take notes by hand. Of course, today uh, you can do it however you want. But I would like to encourage, I'll use that word, okay? You're uh, grown-up professionals, uh, you can interpret that as you can. I'd like you to write a synopsis of the talk below them, uh, uh, altogether a full page, at least 200 words, you know? Uh, I just want to see you engaging. You're putting the needle onto the record, although that's, I guess people listen to vinyl now, so you understand that metaphor. You put the needle onto the groove so that we actually engage with what's going on. A scan it as a PDF and submit it on Canvas by next week for credit. All, everything's active online already. And for this one, not for future ones necessarily, but for this one, I'll post the slides on Canvas. Okay? Think, yes, that is where we start. Any questions about the class as a whole in your pre-syllabus state? Right, handwritten is good enough, and if I can't read it, I'll get back to you. Okay. Yes. Well, you can skip out the middleman if I, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be um, that that much, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to try to be too much of a pain. But when when it's useful, I'll be a pain. I'll be a useful pain. Okay. Yeah. Any, any good questions? Any others? All right, with that in mind, let's jump into things. I've got more than a slide a minute, okay? So the point of this is not for you to, it's kind of a kaleidoscope. And it's literally a kaleidoscope because I want to talk about uh, the things that we can see in the world. And as a chemist, I want to talk about the chemistry behind those things. Let me double check that I'm recording here. Yes, we're good. And as I switch over, I want to show you this new toy that I got. It's a lucite block. This is a museum. Okay, it's called the Mini Museum 3. And it's this guy who gets these fragments and he validates and certifies the fragments and puts them into the lucite block. All right, so you can see it. And so let me show you from your standpoint, not even the front row can really see it this way. That's why we have technology. Let me show you what's in the Mini Museum. All right, so let me just put this up here for you. Why don't you tell me what, why don't you raise your hand and uh, tell me what catches your eye with these? They're roughly in chronological order. Which one of these uh, jumps out to you? What, do you? what do you see here? The turtleneck, Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs turtleneck. <laughs> right? So apparently I own a piece of Steve Jobs turtleneck. I, I don't know if I can extract his DNA from his sweat. There's probably not much DNA in sweat. Too bad, you know. And I'm not, we're not cloning Steve Jobs in biochem, okay? Any other things that you see that are, that are interesting here? Like if you could pick one to take out and look at it, which you can't, but which one would you pick? Yeah. Yeah, the Viking axe. And um, where is that one? That's sort of... Oh, there it is. Right next to the samurai sword, right? Yeah, so you can see that. A piece of Alcatraz, the um, Pele's soccer ball. Maybe his foot kicked this right here. Uh, and one other little thing. Uh, if you, I don't know if anyone's ever been to J.R.R. Tolkien's grave. It's in Oxford, outside Oxford, technically. And um, you go there, and there's a rose bush growing out of the grave. And so I'm thinking, I'm putting my biochemistry together, and I'm like, 
some of those carbon atoms in that rose bush might have been in J.R.R. Tolkien's body. So I touched the rose bush just so I can say that one of my... But it's interesting, we have these relics and some of them are genuinely chemically, we could get something out of it, like oldest to earth or space gems or great oxygenation event. We can see things, a giant sloth claw and things like that. The samurai sword has a chemical composition. But some of them are only special because of the history and we have to kind of trust and take it on faith it's interesting to me that how these are like relics, okay? We have to trust and take it on faith that this was actually a turtleneck and, and the guy just didn't go down to the gap and uh, cut up a, a piece of black cloth and say that it was Steve Jobs, you know? So you can look at all that and, and it's interesting that museums do have an element of faith to it. There's the part that you can't see. You can't see this stretching back in time. I'm sort of trusting the, the guy who did that. Now, to earn my trust, he put a lot of things online about him making these, these videos, but that could have been faked, right? You can fake anything these days. But the samurai sword was interesting because they also included a piece of fabric, I believe from the time period as well. And I noticed in the piece of fabric is dyed blue. So there's some chemistry going on that made that fabric blue. And I'm actually interested in what makes that color as well as what makes the sword sharp. And so I want to focus on the color of blue today. And when I talk about these, I'm going to talk about s several different topics. I'm going to talk about the perception of color through rainbows. Then we're going to talk about blue pigments, what makes things blue, blue M&Ms. And then blue honey, which you didn't know could exist, but I'll show it to you. Blue lobsters, which is more of a biological thing. That's naturally blue. But the question is, what is natural, what's artificial? Blue people, there are some diseases that turn you blue. Um, and not from an oxygen-based perspective, like actually turn you blue. How does that happen? And so all these have something to do with color, and all of these have something to do with physics, biology, and chemistry, different proportions of each. And I'm going to kind of go through it, and where you're interested, you can go back and you can expand on it in your final paper. So I'm giving you all this. Um, all right. So the first thing is, where does color come from? What's the most colorful, amazing color f phenomenon that we have in nature? And I think the rainbow's got to be right up there. So how does a rainbow make color? So one of the things is, where do you look for a rainbow? When you, when you need to see a rainbow, how do you find one? And how would I know? There have been cases since I've learned this where I've said to myself, oh, I should be able to see a rainbow. And then you start looking around, and there it is. If you know that you should see it, then you can see it more easily, okay? So, where do rainbows come from? The one thing is, everybody, look at this picture. There's a little clue in it for where the sun is. Anybody want to point to the sun? Assuming that we're all oriented toward this picture. Where's the sun? Yeah, you can sort of point that way. And it's not up, right? It's back, because the sun needs to be at a low angle and it needs to be passing through rain. The rain acts as a sort of prism. How can raindrops act as a prism? Well, one of the other clues that we can see, I don't know if you've ever seen a rainbow from a plane. The rainbow is not really a, uh, an arc. If, it, if it's an arc, it's just because we can't see the full circle. So the rainbow is a full circle. The rainbow is made by a sun. The sun is itself a full circle that makes light, right? It's this, so it's a disk that makes light to our perspective. And so the sun is actually, an, the rainbow is an image of the sun. The rainbow is derived from the sun. And it's also uh, derived from you, your act of observation looking at it. Because it's the light coming into your eyes from this perspective. So how does it make, how does it make those colors? Well, the other thing is, how, what other kinds of ways can you see a rainbow? I just showed you a way that you can see a rainbow from a plane. There's actually another way that you can sometimes see a rainbow from a plane that I'm wondering if anyone's seen. So, what other things, what other kinds of rainbow-like phenomena are there that might help us understand how do these rainbow-like things form? Does anybody else know the variations on a rainbow that you can see? Has anybody ever seen something like a rainbow, but not a rainbow. What do you think? So you've got the, the prism thing, right? Yeah. Um, 
and the prism uh, separates white light into the, the colors. And so raindrops are clear like the prism is clear. So there's, it, that, and that is exactly one of the things that's going on. You know, um, raindrops somehow as a cloud act as a collective prism. Something like, like that is going on, but it's also, they're not arranged exactly like a prism. Something else is going on as well. John, what's that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and soap bubbles are circular for a different reason, for sort of a chemical reason, but the, um, the colors in it, you see the visible wavelengths of light, and you see things going on only at certain times. The color is not like, the color in soap bubbles is not put there by like molecules, chemical molecules that are colored blue, yellow, or red. There's something in the structure of the soap bubble. Just like there's something in the structure of a prism, you know, a prism has to have a very distinct triangular structure to work well. Something in the structure is important of the thing that's moving the light around, the lensing the light, okay? Any other things? Has anybody ever looked out the window at an airplane or, or yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually I was just walking out back by the, by the trail back here and there was a really nice, sometimes you only get a couple of the rainbows, sometimes you get a full spectrum. And that's from the structure of the oil floating on top of the water. And so that's actually carbon atoms. Yeah, and so there's something going on with the light there. Again, the light is being separated. So yeah, how does this work? And we can, that's exactly what they did when they went, Isaac Newton wanted to find out what was behind these phenomena. And he did all sorts of experiments on things, places where he could see rainbows to the extent of even like pushing a needle next to his eye to deform his eyeball. That guy was dedicated, okay? Yeah. Any other, um, there was one time when I saw a rainbow looking out my plane window that wasn't like the, the picture that we had before. There was another difference. Has anyone ever seen your shadow on a plane when you're flying uh, above clouds in a sunny area. If you have the right conditions, and I saw this myself uh, going from Spokane from the Murdoch conference, so um, you see what's called a glory. You see a circular rainbow around the plains. It, it, this is not a great picture of it, but it was bright as day when I was coming back. You can see the sort of rainbow circle around the plane's shadow. There, it's similar physics, but different a little bit because the projection is different, but you've also got raindrops working as a cloud. There, there is a difference, and if you want to dig into this, this is one of the things as a physics person, you might be able to say, what is the difference between a glory, which is this, and a rainbow, which is that? But I don't know if any of you have ever seen a moonbow, but you can. You know, so um, it's harder to get the conditions where you see this, but if you have the moon projecting, then you actually see the, the same circle for the fog over the waterfall. And you can actually have a fog bow done from the sun through the fog. It's very faint. You can see that it's kind of washed out, right? But fog can produce a fog bow, which is slightly different from a rainbow, apparently. Okay? So all these phenomena can come together, and it's actually, it actually is a uh, complicated question of what exactly makes the rainbow. Because the water droplets aren't just acting as prisms, they're acting as mirrors and lenses as well. And so they scatter and they tend to focus light 138 degrees from the incident direction. So if the sun is there, the rainbow will be here with a 138 degree angle. That's why the sun needs to be low in the sky for you to see a rainbow in this direction. Okay? So whenever the sun is low in the sky and you have the possibility for some rain to lens it, if you have enough sun and rain in a weird combination, then you get a rainbow, okay? So that's how you can uh, look for a rainbow, with low sun with some kind of rain in the air. You can dig into that a lot more. You can dig into that and say, well, if this visible light is doing this, I wonder if infrared is as well. Somebody took an infrared camera, and you can see past the red part of the rainbow, you have infrared colors being scattered and lensed by the light as well. It's just you can't see them, but the infrared camera can. Invisible rainbow, I don't know if that happens in the UV. At some point it's got to stop because eventually you get the second rainbow. Eventually the, the lensing is such that you end up with the, the, um, the colors in reverse order. If you look carefully here, you can see them in reverse order for the second rainbow. 
And then you can do things like, you can say, where are weird uh, colors? Has anybody actually ever seen the green flash at sunset? Apparently it's real, okay? But it's one of those other things that we kind of have to take it by the faith on the statement of witnesses, okay? Um, although this, this camera picture appears to show it, but I don't know, I kind of doubt it. If we have cameras, we doubt them, you know? It's that kind of thing, that's where we're stuck. Uh, we're epistemologically limited, if to use some philosophical terms. But the whole thing about the green flash, I had some people in previous classes that have seen a, pre a green flash. Has anybody seen it? I'll believe you if you raise your hand. So <laughs> I'm not going to ask for proof. But um, I had some people, so it, apparently it's like less than one in a hundred people have seen the green flash. But like out in Hawaii, where you can actually see the sunset, uh, when the sun sinks below the horizon, there's some time where the conditions are just right and you see a flash of green, which is where the sun's light is being lensed and refracted by the atmosphere. That's interesting. So, but the main thing I want to focus on is I want to focus on one color and say, how does that color come about? Because of all of these colors, the sky is blue, right? But not much else is actually blue. Blue is a rare color with the exception of the atmosphere looking up. So um, physics can explain, actually some people relate the whole thing about the airplane glory uh, to like the reason why people have halos around their heads. There's a certain condition where you can look at a cloud and see sort of a, a, a glowing uh, sphere of light around your own head and it will move with you. Some people say that there are halos. I'm not sure that you need that story to explain halos. But I do know that um, there are certain colors that are associated with certain biblical figures. And so if you know how to, if you know the code, you can always find Mary in any of the paintings by looking for the blue. And blue is a hard color to make, stably. In fact, the way they used to make it is they used to let take this semi-precious stone, lapis lazuli, and crush it and suspend it in oil and smear it on the thing. And that would make this blue. So this might be literally a uh, crushed lapis lazuli, crushed jewelry. That's because lapis lazuli has this particular formula in it. And if you look at this, most of these are, all of these elements are normally in rock. So there must be some special shape of these elements. And if you look carefully at this, while you actually can't see anything unusual from this standpoint, this just looks like a rock formula. These are common elements. It's not like there's Einsteinium in here or something like that that's making it blue. So it comes from a normal element in a weird shape. Sulfur in a weird triangle, for those chemists among us, is a triatomic radical anion. If you can make enough of that and preserve it in a rock matrix, it turns the rock blue. And so that's actually sulfur that you're seeing that's making that blue color. And so it's a crushed sulfurous gem that's making this uh, Duccio's Madonna have her blue color. And so it's something like that, okay? Something like the, the three S's reapplied there. And we can actually prove it, you know, we can actually look for the, the spectroscopic signal of that, okay? If you, if you take it and put it under a special microscope and there's a certain kind of technique that can pinpoint lapis lazuli particles in this uh, blue of the Virgin Mary's robe in this crucifixion right here and they actually can find it from, uh, they, they light up, the crushed, uh, the crushed sulfur still lights up. So um, if you want to go in more into that, that's an opening for you. You could follow these through. There's, there's whole articles about the trisulfur radical anion. So you latch on to that specific piece. Search for it. Google's a powerful tool to get started. Google Scholar is great. And you can find out that there are things like a review that talks about how this particular arrangement of sulfur is used in many different areas and how sulfur radical species are associated with gold deposits on Earth. Well, that's kind of interesting and that might be useful if you're interested in how gold forms. How can I find gold? I mean, that's the direction you could go in as well. So lapis lazuli is made by the Earth and it's a blue color. It's a blue rock. It's unusual. Now, of course, you have colors from old days from medieval stained glass that is colorful, and they, they make some of the glasses blue, some of the glasses red, some of the glasses orange. They make a rainbow by mixing stuff into glass. The really interesting thing is the stuff they mix into glass is not originally colored. 
It's not like they're putting the equivalent of food coloring into the glass. What they, they did, and it was, was probably found by accident, but they did something that we now classify as nanotechnology. If you look closely at the, uh, at the windows, you see small particles of uniform size and shape. And so now we call those nanoparticles, and we put that under material science chemistry. Back then, they didn't have that. They just knew that if they mixed up the glass right, they would be able to make it. So these days, we can look at the stained glass, and we can see that there are metallic nanostructures. So somehow, the metal mixed in the glass is making that color. And they figured out if you mixed gold into the glass under certain conditions, it would turn red. Uh, under other conditions, it might turn green. And they had unwittingly stumbled upon this nanotechnology synthesis. This is a cool uh, thing that you can look at in more detail, but r the thing I want to show you is over here. These are the actual particles in red stained glass. These are gold particles of 100 nanometers, or actually these are 25 nanometers wide. If you do that, you get red stained glass, and some of the windows in Chartres are going to have that color from the gold mixed in. They also mixed in silver, and they made 100 nanometer spheres that looked yellow. And these colors also don't fade because the gold and the silver are going to stay there, suspended in the glass. The light is not going to make those fade, okay? Light can't make gold go away. Gold is going to stay there. But now what we can do is we can do more colors, like if we do a sphere of gold that is small, that is bigger, I'm sorry, 50 nanometers as opposed to 25, that looks green. If we do a bigger one, it, uh, it looks yellow, just like the silver does. And if we do silver that's smaller, we actually can make it blue. So now that we have more, uh, more methods to approach this problem, we can make more colors from the same basic technique. But it's not all that different from the, from the windows that they had 1,000 years ago, or 800, whatever it is. But now that we know more, we found that you can actually use green tea as a reducing agent to take a gold solution and turn it into gold nanoparticles. And you see that when you do that, you turn it from this color to that color, and you make sort of a purplish-reddish kind of color. I'm really interested in this. I would love to do this someday. I haven't gotten the, um, the right class to mix it into. But people who are interested in education, by the way, there's lots of stuff you can do where you can do like you can do real nanoparticles. You don't need a fancy catalyst. You need tea leaves. So you might be able to do this if you end up in a high school or if you end up in, a, um, in some other situation teaching. These are different ways that you can make nanoparticles. Darjeeling tea plus gold chloride, egg white, vitamin C plus copper rods will make an antifungal nanoparticle, like the stuff that's in Ziploc containers and stuff like that. And in sunscreen, you have zinc microparticles. Chemists, and this also has physics, too. I would definitely take it in whatever direction you want. In fact, uh, this person took it in an artistic direction. They layered silver nanoparticles between sheets of glass, and they got our nice blue color. It's very versatile and can produce a lot of different colors. And a lot of artists, actually, I've uh, I found that the, the art faculty make really great friends to have, because you can talk to them. And honestly, uh, if, if you, uh, they have some great ideas for just taking what's normal to a chemist and making art that no one else can make out of it. At a place like this, we can talk, I can have art faculty friends. It's a lot harder at a bigger university. So that's one of the things I like about SPU. Okay? The other thing is that these nanostructures actually have their uses. They're used on Mars. The Mars rover Curiosity, you've probably heard of it. It has camera lenses, and they include nanoparticles just like those in medieval stained glass because they're easy to make. That's why they made them. And so they took those, and the, the thing about those nanoparticles is they absorb UV light. They shield the lenses from the harsh UV light of, the Mar of Mars without its ozone layer or without its protective atmosphere. There's more about this on the talk of the scientist who, who is the head of one of the major instruments on this. His name is Roger Wiens, and he gave a talk at the 2016 American Scientific Affiliation Conference. 
This is a group of scientists who are Christians that get together and they tell each, talk to each other about faith and science every year. And they put it all online. Here's a Roger's talk, and it's about how, uh, it's about his, his navigation of grants and grants going away and um, people saying things that weren't true about his lab and then, uh, you know, uh, government employees taking the money away and giving the money away and, and how he approached all this instability of being in space exploration as a scientist who's also a Christian. He talks about when he went, went to church when he was at a really low point and he went to a church service at one point and the worship service was, plays an important role. So that's not a spoiler too much. You can watch this, and this is a significant uh, contribution if you're interested in, uh, in physics exploration and things like that. And there he is. So there are some rocks that can be blue. Fluorite can be blue-ish, okay? And there's, uh, you can talk about where that color comes from. There's this tourmaline that can be bluish, and they call this the Windows XP tourmaline. You guys have probably seen that enough to see where um, this was created way before Windows, but it's pretty amazing. That's its natural color. And so all the, the thing about gems, different gems, all have, if you look up and down here though, you'll see that there's different formulas for each of these. But what's making them different colors is simple inorganic chemistry. Actually the sulfur trianion is the most complex structure probably that you have. Most of these are caused just by aluminum ions, just like by little bits of aluminum being suspended in, uh, in a matrix will make this a blue sapphire. So that's what sapphires really are. Inorganic chemistry and gems are simple chemistry from a large part of the periodic table. But on the other hand, biological things have an advantage over those because they can make more complex structures using organic chemistry. And so that's what actually is big in the history of chemistry because for a long time uh, chemists made money and made industry by making different colors that you could put onto the different fabrics, like the samurai fabric that we had here. So um, you have these old dye laboratories where basically organic chemists just tried tons of different colors. I think I have some examples here. So you like open up these drawers and you have these literal drawers of colors, which are all different organic chemical substituents on different, you know, aniline dyes and things like that. And it's really cool. People are looking into uh, how the history of this developed, but the main thing is there was a lot of interest in this kind of chemistry because we wanted to make new colors so that we could put them on fabrics and sell new textiles. Here's a color, and then, and then of course they would test them. They would take the little patches of color and they would heat it for five minutes at 350 and see how they changed and things like that. So it's just kind of a, a neat thing. And as they looked at different colors, they could find different things. Like here's one scientist who says it's the bluest chemical I know. This one is solid vanadyl sulfate. So this is actually a pretty simple compound. It's just vanadium and um, sulfate ion put together, but it makes that really nice untouched blue. No filter on these. Okay? And so because of that, you can actually get, if you have a chemist that you're looking to get a gift for, I don't know of any chemist who wouldn't love this, um, you can get like little labels, or you can probably make them yourself if you can see them here, and you can put them on crayons. So here's that vanadyl ion that is this bright blue color. So chemists really like colors. Uh, you all don't remember Lyle Peter. He was here for a long time, but like his favorite thing was color. He would always talk about it and uh, he'd always do it in lab. And so we still today have chemists who go looking for colors. It's just that there are some chemists who work as dye chemists in labs, but we've sort of exhausted that route. Now they're sort of bioprospecting. So they're going to places. Here's a scientist where they noticed a weird blue algae bloom. And so they looked in, and they isolated what made this blue. It turns out it's this molecule right here. So an unusual blue color comes from an unusual organic plus inorganic chemistry structure right here. You can look into this more. There's other people who, uh, and, and they, these people are like blue hunters. You know, they, they're looking for blue colors in nature. Here's one from a marine derived species of Streptomyces. And that is just kind of a cool petri dish color to have, you know, isn't that just kind of, 
sometimes you can just find something that in the lab that looks different and just makes you happy to look at it. And I don't know, that, could, that blue is right up there with the things I, 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 it's just nice to look at it. And then it's not as nice to look at the structure, but this is the structure where it comes from. And the question is, why does this bacterium make this structure? And why is it so blue? Okay, and then you can look at other structures, like this berry. It's blue, but it doesn't have any pigments. You look in it and you, you can try to isolate stuff like this. You can't. It's making this blue color without making a specific pigment molecule. So the question is how? There's another way to make blue color. And if you think about the rainbow, remember the rainbow and the prism and the examples that we mentioned? Those are produced by a certain shape of something. Okay? So if you have the right shape, you can sort of do like a, not quite a prism type arrangement, but you can make something that looks blue, is colored blue, without having an actual blue molecule. So they examined this. Here's an optical microscope image, and they, they looked at it, and they found out that what's blue is cellulose. Now, you all know that cellulose is all through everything. It's in your paper. It's in, uh, it's in, every, it's, it's in a lot of things. You know, a lot of plants are made from cellulose. Cellulose normally is not blue. You know, we look around and we see a lot of green, a lot of red. We don't see a lot of blue. But it turns out that you can arrange cellulose in a very particular way so it acts, it acts, I don't want to say prism again, but it, it, re, it interacts with light to make a blue color from the shape of the fibrils, okay? So they looked at it very closely and they found out this, this particular arrangement of cellulose makes it look blue. Um, I'm going to put that up if you're interested, but um, you can investigate this more, and this is all from the exact things that I have. It's the geometry of the cellulose helicoids can circularly polarize light. So this can do something else cool physically to light. There is a berry from South Africa that's also bluish, and it turns out that it's actually evolved to mimic another blueberry that actually has pigments that actually act as nutrients. But this one's faking it, okay? It makes these colors from cellulose. It doesn't matter to the animals. The animals still see the blue and they eat it. So this is kind of a little bit of trickery on the biological level. But again, this is, uh, this is cellulose fibers. This is not an actual blue pigment that's going to be in the plant. What's really cool about these, though, they found out this particular arrangement, like normally they're under strain. When they isolated them and they put them under less strain, they saw the color changed. So it became green, or if you, if you reduce the strain, it becomes more and more red. Because the structure's changing. How does that work? I'd be interested to know. So if you want to find out and get back to me on your final paper, that's a perfectly valid way to go. But the main thing is, if this is just collagen, and if you have collagen in you, you know, in your skin and things like that, couldn't you, could, theoretically, rearrange your collagen to be blue? And actually, some mammals can. In fact, if you think about it, and maybe this is where biologists can help me out. Biologists, can you think of a mammal with blue skin? What's that? A whale. A, a, a whale, yeah. That's, and that actually may be related to this phenomenon. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more of from the primate family. But uh, um, yeah, the blue whale, I mean, you can't get away from that. And it's also large. So yeah, I don't know about how that relates, but that would be another mode of investigation. Did I have a hand back here for somebody thinking of a blue mammal? Blue, a mammal with a blue patch, at least? It's not, but it's baboons and mandrills, those primates, they have, um, they have blue. And so there's the mandrill. This blue color comes from it doing the same thing as the berry. It's rearranged its collagen, so the collagen has the blue structure. Now, the other thing is, if you turn the mandrel around, apparently the rump skin is also blue. That's something I did not know. Okay? If you look at male vervet monkeys, they also are blue. It turns out that they have blue scrotums. Okay? Um, biologists, you can talk about that, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, a male mouse opossum also has a blue scrotum. These are literally blue colors. These don't just look blue. Uh, and so they've somehow arranged, and they come from their collagen. 
What's really interesting is if you look at their collagen, their collagen's all arranged in the same way. This blue color is made from the same arrangement of collagen. This clearly is not something that was in the ancestor and passed down and then just hidden in all of us, okay? It's something that actually evolved convergently rather than divergently. They, um, they, in a sense, they figured out, if I want to use that very loose language, evolution figured out how to make blue color in the same way in very different species. If that interests you, go for it. There it is. Okay. Then there's the other thing. If you're a doctor, someday you might have to diagnose somebody coming in who's blue. This is, it's not like Smurf blue, it's like this blue, okay? But still, this doesn't look right, right? You know, if you compare the, these, uh, these two people, actually that one looks kind of red. But, uh, and if you take their blood, you'll notice that their blood is darker than it should be. And if you know about uh, hemoglobin and things like that, you'll know that venous blood is bluish, you know, right? And arterial blood is reddish, and it has to do with the oxygen. Well, it turns out that has to do with the color of blood itself. So blood is red because of this molecule right here. And by the way, a bruise turns green because when this molecule breaks down, it turns green. Billy Veridin is green. And then it turns yellow, Billy Rubin is yellow, before it's excreted from the body. Urine, in fact, is yellow because it's broken down blood. It's broken down red stuff, but it's uh, getting uh, pushed out as urobilin, this broken down version of this molecule. So that looking at the blood this way can show a lot of commonalities. And yes, feces also are brown because of that. Again, go after what you want. But um, I'm going to talk about the blue people, OK? It turns out that these people are bluish because they have, uh, they have extra methemoglobin, which sounds like it's a different molecule. But really what it is is it's a molecule right here with instead of, uh, with more iron 2 instead of iron 3 in the middle. There's a ratio of these in everyone, actually. Um, and it turns out that the ratio is more tilted. It's, it's actually been, it's, the ratio is usually on this side, on the ferrous heme side. But uh, methemoglobin is actually the, uh, is hemoglobin that has been oxidized. That means an electron has been removed from it. And you have three pluses rather than two. This is bluish. These people have a problem where they have too much of this kind of ferric heme and it ends up coloring their skin. It's called cyanosis. You can see where the medical term comes from. And it, this is caused by these people not having enough of this enzyme, which turns the 3 plus version into the 2 plus version. They don't have enough of this, and therefore they have too much of this. This builds up because it tries to go over here, but it can't because there's not enough of the enzyme to convert it. Therefore, th those people end up blue because they're missing a protein. The irony is, to treat the patients, well, okay, the problem is that they have too much Fe3+, you need to give them something that, that pushes electrons onto the iron and does the job of the enzyme for it. And it turns out if you have uh, this dye, methylene blue will push electrons onto things very well. The irony is it's also blue. So you give the blue person a blue dye to make them unblue, and you tell them this is normal, okay? You're going to pee out that blue dye, and don't freak out. You're actually getting rid of the blue. However you want to express that to them as their doctor is what part of the social skills and competencies that you need to develop, okay? Um, but yeah, that's what it looks like. But also, of course, just because they're blue doesn't mean that um, that must be the diagnosis. That man is blue because he's been exposed to silver. That's actually silver nanoparticles in his skin. So um, we're not quite sure. <laughs> he was at a debate, apparently. I'm not sure what they were debating. Uh, but um, just because you have one symptom obviously does not mean that you can diagnose. Otherwise, we would not have the whole house MD would always be two minutes long, you know, if you remember that show. The final thing is if you have, there's big business still in getting blue colors and chemists making blue colors, but a problem is sometimes those blue colors get out of the factory. So there was an M&M's factory that was making a lot of blue color, and one day the farmer next to the factory started to notice that he had all this blue honey. It turns out that somehow, I'm not even sure how, 
Oh, oh yeah, the, the colorful shells of the M&M were just dumped outside and the bees were eating them up. And so they ended up making blue honey. You could eat that, you know, it's a safe dye, right? I assume, although I'm not sure I'd want to. <laughs> but you know, the thing is the bees are connected to the chemistry of their environment, okay? So now people are trying, I mean, blue, everyone wants to have blue colors, but it's hard to make a blue color. There are organic chemists working on making new natural blues so that you can put a label on your thing that says no artificial flavors. What does that really mean? But there's people who are looking at those algae. So apparently it's better to get your blue from an algae than to make it in a lab because you can put natural because it comes from pond scum. But, you know, oh well. The, the one thing I'll leave up for you is the story of the blue lobsters. You see that blue lobster right there? That's actually a story that combines chemistry, physics, and biology. But I will let you look at that yourself, and you can literally go after that. You'll be able to look at that. It turns out that if you take a red pigment and twist it, it turns blue. And that's what's happening in the blue lobster. It's the same red pigment that makes flamingos pink. And I'm just going to put that up there so that you can look at all that. And, oh, and there's physics. Okay? It has physics involved. So the last thing I want to tell you, ask questions, integrate knowledge, synthesize your experiments, and the point is for you to become a chemist and think like a scientist. So please scan your notes, write a synopsis at the end. Don't forget the synopsis, just a couple sentences, but focus on what's important specifically. Uh, do handwritten notes and scan that. Turn it in on Canvas. You've got a week to do it. Next week we have off and then we have a seminar on the week after that. So, have a good two weeks and I'll see you then. Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. yeah. Which one?